Hi, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for coming along. It's a real pleasure to be here in Sofia and at the, this RACIO event. So this is our home, planet Earth. And if we want to organize all the geography, all the different places on Earth, that's pretty much solved. You can go online, you can find a map somewhere, you can zoom in to Europe and then to Bulgaria and then to Sofia and then to the tech park pretty easily. We know where everything is. But what about all life on Earth, all the living things, all the different species? What about organizing them? Well, for more than 200 years, we've had this neat idea for organizing life, the tree of life. You can think of the leaves as being different kinds of life, and the branches show higher levels of structure, things that hold them in common. This is one of the first drawings of the Tree of Life. It's done by an artist in the year 1801, Augustine Augier. This is before Darwin, before evolution was thought of, because we realized that uh, all of life is organized in this way. What we know now is that the tree of life actually tells us a truth about evolution, about how everything got here. Uh, we, for instance, humans, we're an example of mammals. They're the warm, furry things, if you like. And mammals are an example of vertebrates, the things with a backbone. And vertebrates are animals, and so on. So we have this neat organization. And we're all related. We're all cousins, however distantly. So, Please bear that in mind and spare a thought for that slug that you caught eating the lettuce in your vegetable patch because this is your cousin and my cousin. Well, actually, it's our cousin 560,000 cousin 270 million times removed. Um, but anyway, that is our cousin. And as well as a slug, we have many, many other cousins on the tree of life. So we can think of life as being organized in species as the fundamental unit, all these different species of life on Earth. They're the leaves of the tree of life. And how many of those are there? So that's what I want to sort of show you first. How many leaves are there on the tree of life? And then we're going to get on to exploring the rest of it. Um, and for this demonstration, I'm just going to get off stage a moment because um, it's very handy. I didn't plan this, but we're in this nice room, and the panels have got these tiny little holes in. You can see these holes here. This hole, I'm going to say that that's us. That's humans, Homo sapiens. We're represented by this, all of us together. Um, and the mammals, the warm, furry things, we're a bit over 5,000 species, so we're one and a half panel. So we maybe stretch from here to here. That's all the mammals. Then we have the rest of the vertebrates. So that's the amphibians, reptiles, birds, and various groups of fish as well. They're going to stretch from the door here, six across and up to the ceiling, so about that much. OK, so that's the vertebrates. Here's where things get really wild. From where I'm standing in amongst this audience here, from about here to the end of the room, all of those dots, that's 400,000 or so different species of plant. Most of those plants are flowering plants, and that's not a coincidence because the flowering plants have relationships with their pollinators that has caused them to diversify into many different species. Over on the other end of the room, all of those dots, 400,000 other things, I'm going to say. So that's going to be the fungi, the bacteria, and then all kinds of weird things I'm not going to name, which aren't fungi or bacteria or plants or animals, which leaves the animals that aren't vertebrates, the invertebrates. So the rest of the room is the invertebrates, except it's not, because the rest of those invertebrates spill into another room, which is completely full as well. And almost all of that is insects. So there's around a million different species of insects alone, almost as much as everything else put together. 
So that's the diversity of life on earth, and that's what we've got to pin on the tree of life, what we've got to show the relationships between all of these things, 2.2 million different species. And I should say that this is an approximation, not just because of all the many species not known to science, which is probably most of them, frankly, but also because we scientists actually don't even know how many we know about. Because there isn't a central database, there's a lots of different strange rules, often the same species gets called by different names, and so we can't just say this is the one number we all agree on for how many species there are, which is a bit of a problem. So let's get on to exploring the tree of life. Here it is. Um, the root of the tree, the base, that's the origin of life. All of these little leaves you see, they're the different species. And we're going to zoom into it, just like we zoom in on some online mapping software. So we're going to zoom in to some uh, new place. I wonder uh, whether any of you have heard of the Bulgarian emerald. Nobody. OK, that's good, because I'm going to show you where the Bulgarian emerald is on the Tree of Life. If you get really seasick, please don't worry. You, you can look away. So all of these 2.2 million leaves are there on the screen somewhere. We just have to know where to zoom in. We've quickly zoomed into animals, now insects, now dragonflies. So the Bulgarian emerald is a dragonfly, and that's the leaf that represents it. I'll show you an image of it separately in a moment, but you'll see that this leaf is red. Red is the color we're using here to represent the species that are under threat of extinction. So unfortunately, this species is under threat. There's actually only 9,000 of them left in the wild. Uh, but they do live in Bulgaria, also in Greece, and also in Turkey. And there's an example of one of them. So um, I need to show you around the Tree of Life now. And I, I wanted to think of some interesting way of doing this. Uh, so at least to start with, I'm going to show you the things that have funny names. Because we've got to choose some principle. And I want to start with this mint sauce worm. There's a, a whole bundle of them uh, there you see on the screen. They're pretty interesting creatures. I use the word worm quite loosely. Um, basically, we use the word worm in common language to mean something that is an invertebrate animal that looks a bit like spaghetti with a, a front and a rear end, we will call it a worm. But they're not necessarily related. There's all different kinds of groups of worms all over the tree of life. This one is in quite a special uh, group. It has a mouth, and when they hatch out of their cocoon, they will go hunting to have their first meal with that tiny mouth. They're hunting for a special kind of algae. If they don't find it, they will die. That's not surprising, I suppose. What is surprising is what happens if they do find it. If they do find it, they eat it with their little mouth, but they don't digest it. It becomes part of their body. It lives inside them. That's actually why they're green. And so they don't eat any other food. This algae photosynthesizes and provides them with energy, but it also provides them with proteins, amino acids, oxygen. It pretty much gives them everything they need. We also have a layer of slime containing bacteria. So they're an example of what we call a hollow biont, a group of, of different organisms sort of living together. So that's the mint source worm. Uh, a couple of other crazy names before we, we get to the, to the real thing here. This one is the scrambled egg slime, also known as, and I'm not making this up, the dog's vomit slime mold. Um, this one, the southern flannel moth, um, which has venomous uh, hairs as its larvae, which is a caterpillar, also known as, and I'm not making this up either, the Donald Trump caterpillar. <laughs> so there's the funny name things, but having shown you that, I want to take you around the tree of life on a kind of tour. And because we're humans and we're self-centered, we're going to start on humans, and we're going to go on a journey to show how we're related to something um, quite nice here, um, how we're related to a jar of Lutonica. <laughs> I love this. This is one of my favorite Bulgarian things. Obviously, it's got uh, two main ingredients, the peppers and the tomatoes. It turns out those two are quite closely related, but I'm going to do peppers. So 
How are we related to the Lutonitsa? So let's start with us. There we are on the Tree of Life. A little bit of a zoom out there. You can see our closest relatives, the chimpanzee and the bonobo. Uh, you'll also see that they are both endangered, sadly. In fact, almost all of our close relatives are endangered with extinction, which is quite sad. Uh, we're not, actually, as you can see from that. Um, uh, but anyway, we have the chimpanzees and the bonobos as our close relatives. And when we see this on the tree of life, uh, what that shows is that the chimpanzee and bonobo are much more closely related to each other than they are to us. And yet, our closest relatives are the two of them together. And when we look at this image, it seems that it's equal. And if you look across the genome of all of the three of us, 95% of it shows that um, the chimpanzee and the bonobo are equal in terms of how closely related to us they are. But evolution doesn't always work in exactly equal terms because things change in different parts of the genome in different ways. And so there is a tiny a difference in terms of overall which one of these we're closer to. Um, and I'm going to ask you to vote on which one we think it is. But just to give you something to go on and to make it a bit more fun, I'll tell you a little fact about each of these two species. So um, the chimpanzee, when they get into arguments, they solve that by having fights. And then the bonobos, when they get into arguments, they solve that with sex and sexual activity. So uh, now, a quick show of hands, who thinks the chimpanzee is, um, has more genetic uh, in common with us? Chimpanzee? OK. And who thinks the bonobo? That is fairly equal. A lot of people didn't vote. I have sympathy for you not voting, because actually the difference is only 0.1%, which is a pretty small difference. But the winner is actually the chimpanzee, I'm afraid. We're slightly closer to them. Um, but I also want to show you, before we move on from this, you'll see this little 6MA there. That means six million years ago. So six million years of evolution separates us from the ancestor we share with the chimpanzee and the bonobo. And another six millions of years of evolution separates that ancestor from the chimpanzee and the bonobo themselves. That ancestor was not a chimpanzee or a bonobo. That would have been something else. And I want to show you with a demonstration, again, how big that six million years is in real terms. So I've got here, which you probably won't see, but it, it is really there. That is one millimeter of string that I cut off. Um, that represents an entire human life in my demonstration. So every one of us, like our whole life, I'm going to say 70 years, hopefully it'll be more than that, but anyway, 70 years is one millimeter. Um, I actually want to ask a, a volunteer from the audience to help me with the next part. Someone from the front, anyone willing to volunteer? Oh, yeah, uh, across there, please come forward, thank you. So I have some things in my little box that I'm going to hand to you to be my assistant. Oh, oh, can I ask your name, please? Mira. Mira. Mira, Mira. Thank you very much. So first of all, I'm going to hand you this. Uh, actually, no, not that. Oh, I've, I've lost it. How annoying. <laughs> Thought I prepared everything here, but apparently I haven't. Um, well, uh, there we go. I'm going to skip that part and give you this one. So I'd like you to start unraveling this. Actually, stop right there, because the first 17 centimeters of this, that's already less than has been unraveled. Um, that's all of our history of our civilization. That's the first agriculture, the first cities, all of the, the history that we think of as, as our human history is already gone in the first 17 centimeters, which is less than that. So now start unraveling the ball of string, please. Um, every millimeter, remember, is a whole person's life, yeah. So, how are you doing? Yeah, I'd like to keep going a bit more. Uh, yeah, and a bit more. There we go. Ah, oh, first knot. That knot right there, that's about 300,000 years ago, and that's the start of our species, Homo sapiens. Before that, there's other species. They're different enough from us that they wouldn't be considered Homo sapiens. They're Homo heidelbergensis. And then there are others more. So you could carry unraveling, but I think we need to stop because it will take too long. Not only do you need to unravel all of that, but you also need to unravel all of this. <laughs> that is what the six million years would be. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mira, for coming to do that. Yeah, we'll just throw that on the floor now. Um, good. So that's six million years. 
get my clicker. And now we're going to zoom out a bit more, and we're going to look at some of our next closest relatives along our route towards um, uh, meeting the pepper. Um, we've already gone zoomed out now to a part where our relatives are not our primates. So we're going to zoom in here just at the bottom of the page, you'll see a rather large leaf that is a kind of tree shrew that I want to show you. Um, and we'll just zoom into it now. There we go. So uh, this is a species that is evolutionary distinct, to use the word uh, th that we like to use. That's because the evolution that leads to it is a lot more than this six million years that I just showed you that for us. This is over 30 million years have been evolving, and the only species left at the end of that process is this pen-tailed tree shrew. So we call it evolutionary distinct. And I'm going to show you quite a few more evolutionary distinct species today. They tend to have quite interesting things about them because they've spent so long evolving, and they're the only ones uh, left on the end of that branch of the tree of life. Um, but to explain why this tree shrew is kind of interesting, I'm going to tell you about its food. So this tree shrew is actually a pollinator. Not all pollinators are insects. It pollinates a uh, plant called the Bertan palm. And the Bertan palm is quite fearsome. It's covered in spines because it doesn't want to be eaten. Who can blame it? The flowers, which of course is where you get the nectar, which is your reward for pollinating that plant, they're pretty spiny and sharp as well. But that is not all because the buds of this Bertan palm, as soon as they start to crack open, get inoculated with a yeast from the wild, and they turn into little breweries. And so that nectar actually becomes alcoholic. It's more than 3% proof. And so this shrew has to climb on these razor-sharp, spiny plants, and its main diet has to be something that's alcoholic. It has to not be drunk, not make mistakes, and impale itself. And I want to show you how much alcohol it drinks in human terms, right? So what it drinks in one evening, um, it, over the course of two to three hours, it's going to drink equivalent of, if I was to drink um, this half glass of wine, this full glass of wine, this other glass of wine, and this full bottle of wine as well. So drinking all of that and then climbing up spines, that's not very easy. But it has adaptations. It has a way of metabolizing alcohol and of coping with it. So it can do that. Evolution has given it that solution. Uh, why does, why does the, the Bertan palm and the tree shrew bother with this at all? Um, well, they're in collaboration, as many plants are with their pollinators. Not all, but many. So the tree shrew wants to get its food. The plant wants to be pollinated. It doesn't want to be pollinated by something that will take its precious pollen away to a plant that isn't a Bertan palm, and it will be wasted. It wants its close relationship with its pollinator so that its pollen gets taken to another of the same species, so you successfully uh, get new Bertan palms. And by making its uh, nectar alcoholic, it puts off most other things from taking that nectar. At the same time, the tree shrew has a secret up its sleeve, so to speak, for coping with this alcohol, so it gets that resource to itself. It doesn't have to share it with other pollinators, with competitors. And so both sides benefit from this kind of tight relationship. But it, it does mean that if one of them goes extinct, the other one will be much more likely to go extinct. Ah, and there it is, just a little bit of a close-up. That's an artist's uh, drawing a bit. So let's move on from the pentailed tree shrew now, and we're coming back. You can see mammals there on the right-hand side of the screen, and what we're really centering on is this group of mammals called the placental mammals. What they have in common is an evolutionary step, which we probably all heard of, the placenta, um, which means that the young um, animals are nourished with a placenta in the womb of their mother until they are born. Those are the placental mammals. And I'll show you one more evolutionarily distinct placental mammal before we move on. And here it is, the aardvark. The aardvark, pretty cool creature. There we go. They live in Africa. They're also evolutionarily distinct. They have more, more than 60 million years of evolution behind them, of which this is the only surviving species. And I'm going to talk about the teeth 
of the aardvark because they're kind of interesting in their own right. Our teeth are hard on the outside and soft on the inside, whereas the aardvark's teeth are like a honeycomb where the wax part is the hard part and the soft part is the honey in between the honeycomb. So they're like that, completely unique um, kind of tooth. Um, Maybe more interesting than the fact they have unique teeth is what they eat with the tooth because they mostly feed on things like ants. They dig up the, the ant hills and they lick up the ants and termites with their long sticky tongues. They don't need teeth really to attack ants. And they also have a gizzard like a bird inside their body for grinding up those ants a bit more. So they definitely don't need teeth for that. They do need teeth, however, to eat a relative of something we like to eat the cucumber. So uh, the cucumber, as you may know, doesn't have much nutritional value, but it does have a lot of water inside it. And water is a pretty valuable resource um, if you live in desert-type environments. Let me show you what the aardvark cucumber looks like. That's a black and white image, I'm afraid. It's the best one I could get. But you can see the leaves and the flowers look very much like the cucumbers we know. And this amazing plant, gets pollinated, and then the flowers turn down and they bury under the ground and they make the cucumbers buried under the ground. They don't grow in the air like the cucumbers we eat. And then the aardvark, which is the only thing to eat these, digs them up, eats them, goes around in the desert, gets its water, and then later on when it goes to the toilet, it leaves the seeds behind with a bit of fertilizer and new aardvark cucumbers grow. So there's another kind of relationship between an animal and a plant, this time about spreading the seeds, which is also important if you want to have new plants. Okay, next stop will be this little thing. Um, this is a vertebrate. Um, but whereabouts is it on the tree of life, and where does this fit in? Well, uh, let's zoom out from the aardvark, and here you're seeing a group of things called the amniotes. That includes the birds, it includes the reptiles, and it includes the mammals. All of these things carry around, in terms of the, 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 the maturation of an embryo, they have a kind of pool of water. That enables them to reproduce away from fresh water. That water might be held inside an egg, in the case of reptiles, birds, and some mammals, or it might be um, inside uh, the amniotic fluid of uh, a mother. Um, that enables them to colonize these um, dry spaces. But our creature that I'm going to show you is actually an amphibian, so it reproduces in the water. And I'm going to show you where it is. There it is. It's actually a frog. And what I showed you, this is the tadpole of that frog. The tadpole was described by scientists back in 1917. They didn't describe the adult frog. They hadn't seen it. Native people of the area where it lives in India, of course, had seen this frog. But it wasn't until the 2000s when the adult frog was described to science. So have a look at that tadpole. It's pretty beautiful, isn't it? So you might think that the adult frog's going to be Similarly beautiful. Let's see. There it is. That is a purple frog. Wonderful, wonderful creatures. Uh, they live under the ground. That's why the scientists hadn't described them, of course. They live under the ground for feeding. The males even call from being still under the ground. They call to the females. The only time they get up from being under the ground is to mate and reproduce, to lay their eggs, which mature into these tadpoles. This is another evolutionarily distinct species. Um, and it also it used to be globally endangered. So it was under threat of extinction. And that's the kind of species that actually, um, I would say, we should try to prioritize with conservation efforts. And there are conservation efforts going on for specifically these species, the ones that are evolutionary distinct and globally endangered. And I just checked up on this, actually. Um, since I uh, made this version of the tree, the purple frog isn't threatened with extinction anymore, thanks to conservation efforts, including education of local people about this animal. So that's a success story. There are some, which is nice. So let's continue our journey towards the pepper. And I've just zoomed us out here to the start of the vertebrates. And I'm going to show you our unlikely closest relatives, 
that are not vertebrates. So what are our nearest cousins that don't have a backbone? What will they be like, do you think? Hmm. Well, I think you'll be quite surprised. They're a group called the Tunicates. Just zoom in there. I know there's no image, but that's uh, what the, uh, an urn tunicate looks like. And each one of these little pores you see there, that's actually a separate animal. So they're living together in a colony. Each of those pores is like the mouth of a single animal, and that big green circle in the center, that's like the shared rear ends that all of these thousands of animals have for filtering the water. And you may think, well, you know, that's got nothing like us. But if you dissect that and look inside each individual animal, you find features that are remarkably common with us, and maybe unexpectedly from seeing this picture. Um, for instance, they are chordates, so they have a kind of cord running down them, even though they don't have a backbone. They also have a little heart, and that little heart has a pacemaker with some similar elements to our own hearts that we have, but also with some differences. For instance, they have two pacemakers. One makes the heart go forwards, and then after a while, maybe because it's tired, nobody really knows, another pacemaker kicks in and makes the heart go back the other way, so the blood doesn't even pump around its body in one direction. So that's uh, an example of the tunicates. Now we're going to go on quite a wild ride because we're zooming out, and I'm going to take you in to a group called the protosomes, which is a really huge group. It includes the insects, but also all of the hard exoskeleton creatures that aren't sent in insects, like spiders and crabs. It includes an awful lot of worms, though not the mint sauce worm I showed you at the beginning, an awful lot of other worms. And I want to show you another kind of strange, uh, wormy thing next. Um, this is its head. I wonder if anyone could imagine what the rest of it looked like. Just, I'll give you a moment to imagine in your heads what the rest of it will look like when I reveal it to you, okay? There it is. Um, now, that's a bit surprising, especially considering that the protosomes and the group that contains us and several other things are in a much bigger group called the bilaterans, which means bilaterally symmetric. So the left-hand side is pretty much the same as the right-hand side. We are symmetrical down the middle. That applies to many, many of these things. Of course, it doesn't apply to this worm. This worm has lost its bilateral symmetry because it's done something else pretty clever. Uh, so why is it like that? Well, I'll tell you a little bit, bit about its life. Um, the head, which is the sort of red part on the left there, um, that is buried deep inside a sponge. Um, and the sponge has lots of branches leading out to the, the vents to the outside world. So the head is dripping on inside the center of the sponge. Um, the digestive system of this worm, incidentally, branches as well. So it's got one front end and a hundred or so rear ends. And each rear end just pokes out of the end of a different place in that sponge. So it's trying to occupy the sponge as much as possible. Um, it's a bit mysterious as to why it does this. Probably it wants to be, have protection from the outside world. Certainly it gets that, being inside a sponge. Probably it's also eating the sponge. Little bits of sponge have been found inside its um, digestive system that it has. Since they don't move, it presumably can't eat anything else apart from the sponge, so it's got that. Um, but not enough to live on, so the hypothesis is that it absorbs carbon directly through its skin. And maybe, and this is just my wild speculation now without having studied these, maybe it's living inside the sponge also because the sponge pumps water through. And by having a faster water flow, you can increase the amount, you can absorb things from that water, which is how they, we think that they live. Right, so let's take another journey now, and I'd better show you at least one insect, given that uh, half of all life in this other room there is different species of insect. Um, so let's just take a zoom into the insect, and I'm going to show you an ant. This is an ant. There's a lot of ants, by the way, for at least 14,000 different species of ant, um, and they're quite wildly organized. Although a lot of this organization is not well known, which is why it's in this lighter color of gray. It means we don't really know, but we've had to put things somewhere. Um, this is the diving ant. So there's a bit of a clue there, but there'll also be a bit of a surprise as well. Here's where the diving ant lives, in the 
dark rainforest of, Bornean rain, uh, of Borneo. And uh, a day in the life of a, a worker ant from one of these nests, uh, she might exit the nest and go hunting for food, as ants, of course, do. So she goes down a special path, this worker ant, to the pool, where she goes diving. Um, that will be for the main course. The dessert is these, these wonderful hanging nectaries above the pool so that she can get sweet uh, nectar whenever she needs it. But inside the pool is the real prey of the diving ant, things like mosquito larvae living inside the pool. And they actually work in pairs, uh, these ants. One of them dives into the pool and swims, which is pretty unusual for an ant, using her six legs, she swims the first stroke with three of them, and then the second stroke with the other three. This has been observed. And then she tries to herd the mosquito larvae to the edge of the pool, where her hunting partner sits waiting. Actually, here's an image of it, to haul the mosquito larvae and other prey out of the side of the pool to be eaten or to be taken back to the nest and fed to other ants. What I think is pretty cool and most remarkable about this story is not so much that you've got an ant that dives, but that this whole thing, the path, the cone-shaped nectaries, and the pool is actually this. It's a plant that hosts the ants. In fact, it's a pitcher plant. Um, pitcher plants are things that have evolved in conditions where there aren't many nutrients in the soil. The things that plants need to live, apart from light to photosynthesize, are all of those bits of goodness that they get through their roots in the soil. But some soil doesn't have enough nutrients to really get along. And so plants have evolved different ways to deal with this. And one of them is to actually turn the tables on the animals and become carnivorous. So we have the carnivorous plants. And pitcher plants are an example of carnivorous plants. They attract insects. The insects get attracted to these pitcher traps that you can see here on the right-hand side. They fall in because the slides are really slippery. And when they fall into the pond, they drown. And the plant can digest them and can collect the nutrients through this uh, pitcher trap. But this one has gone one step further because it's formed these special relationship with these diving ants. The diving ants don't get eaten by the plant. They help the plant. They overpower things that might escape the trap. They smooth out the waxy sides of the pool to make them even more lethal. They look after it. And in return, they get the reward of the nectar. They get the reward of the mosquito larvae, which would otherwise hatch out and take precious nutrients away from this picture that the plant otherwise has full control over. Um, which I think means it's about time for us to move away from the animals and toward the plants and toward the, the pepper and toward um, the conclusion, really, of the talk. So we'll go on a bit more of a journey here. We're zooming out of the ants now and then the insects. There we go. Quite a long journey. And we're going to get back in a moment to the origin of animals. You can see just at the top there, these are the bilaterally symmetric animals. And at the bottom, there are the ones that are not bilaterally symmetric. Actually, the ordering of some of these is a hotly debated uh, topic. Uh, but that, that's another story. These at least are the animals. Um, if we zoom out a bit more, we're going to get to some next closest relatives that we might be surprised at. Actually, um, we're more closely related to fungi than we are to plants, so um, the fruiting bodies of some fungi being the mushrooms that we eat. But other examples of fungi are the yeast that made this alcohol and the alcoholic nectar of the, the Bertan palm. Also, lichens are, are, are there as well. So they're a well-known example of our next closest relative. And we're entering the area of the plants. I'm skipping past a lot of things here, of course, because there's over 2.2 million species on the, on the known tree of life. But we're zooming into the orchids. Oh, by the way, there's a, a really nice exhibition on orchids in the Natural History Museum in, in Sofia, which I, I was lucky enough to see yesterday. Um, but this is not a Bulgarian orchid. This is an orchid from Australia. I've got a bit of picture of it here. This is an underground orchid. Um, so I've shown you an underground frog. This is an underground orchid. You wouldn't think a plant would get along very well underground because they need to have leaves, they need to photosynthesize to survive, or do they? Because this underground orchid actually robs everything it needs from shrubs that grow nearby. 
so, and, and it has a relationship, as many plants do, actually with another kind of uh, fungi that lives under the ground, um, the, the mycorrhizal fungi. So it has all of that. Its flower, though, of course, it has to have, otherwise it can't reproduce. And the flower, too, remarkably, is also underground. All you see, if you walk past one of these in Australia, and there aren't many of them, actually, um, according to the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which um, hold all the records for whether things are endangered or not, um, uh, there are only nine of them in the wild known. And that's why they're critically endangered, because their habitat is, is being lost and being changed due to climate change. Um, however, I hope that there may be more that just haven't been seen. We don't know. But they don't really emerge above the ground at all. This one must have been dug up for this image. Um, they just leave little cracks, and ants have been seen to crawl into those cracks to be attracted somehow to that orchid to pollinate it. And then once pollinated, um, it produces fruits. Uh, nobody knows who eats them, but something definitely eats them or used to eat them because those fruits will have probably been dug up, dispersed somewhere to make new orchids. I should say also, and this is very bad for these orchids, not only are there only nine of them, as far as we know, but they need to live to be nine years old before they can make one of these flowers. And having a long length of, of life until you can reproduce is another big red flag if something needs to be conserved, because a lot can change in nine years. You might not even get to, to, to make any seeds. So that's the orchid, and we're now heading towards the group that contains both the tomato and the, the pepper, the solanales. Many, many plants, of course, remember, there's over 400,000 different species of, of plant. Um, here we are uh, with this group. Also uh, related around here, we've got the uh, potato, the aubergine, uh, many other delicious things, uh, as well as many things that may be delicious but you definitely don't want to eat, like the deadly nightshade, which is definitely bad. Um, but let's zoom in now to the pepper. Um, this is uh, exactly the, um, the, the pepper that we use in the Lutonitsa, um, but it's not the only pepper of this species, the um, uh, capsicum annuum. Uh, chili peppers like uh, the jalapenos, they're also the same species. So what's happened is that many thousands of years ago, Human beings found these peppers in the wild, and they were doing agriculture, and so they started artificially selecting them for different properties that they wanted to have in their food, both for sweet ones and for ones that are quite hot. Um, so, hmm. <clears throat> okay, so. I'm in a bit of pain now. Um, what I'm feeling in my mouth is a kind of heat. It's like I'm being burned. That's why we say hot, actually. That's not a coincidence. The capsaicin inside this pepper um, is tricking the receptors in my mouth to thinking that I'm being burned. That's why it's painful. That's why it's not very nice. That is a thing that evolved in the wild chili. The wild type, before any domestication, the capsicum annuum, has this capsaicin around its seeds. And for good reason, because remember that the, the purpose of fruits to the plant is to be spread by something that's going to give those seeds a chance to grow. What did I do as a mammal? I used my teeth to crunch up those seeds, so they probably won't be able to grow now. If a bird had taken that and swallowed it, those seeds would pass through the bird unharmed. And guess what? Birds don't have the same senses as we have in their beaks. They don't feel that heat. They're unaffected by it. You could give them one of those awful California reapers. They wouldn't notice a thing. They could just eat it straight away. Of course, um, those really hot chilies don't exist in the wild. That's something that we've artificially selected for as part of the domestication process. OK, so as we wrap up, let's just go over sort of the, the main messages, really, of what I wanted to show you today, which is really just to show you about biodiversity, the variety of life on Earth. That includes not just all of the different species, but all of the variation within the species and 
some of, which, some of the species, how they're so much more unique and have these amazing features like the branching worm. You know, we've seen the, the colony of animals with a million mouths and one rear end, as well as the animal with one mouth and a hundred rear ends. So we've seen all of that. And sorry, I'm afraid this chili is still affecting me a bit. Um, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so we've seen all those amazing things. And uh, I guess I want to ask, what, where, why do we need all of this? Well, uh, there is the, uh, the well-known and obvious reasons, which is we see this biodiversity around us, and we know that we need it. We know we need pollinators to pollinate our crops. Um, uh, we know we need that. Um, but then there is all the things that we don't even realize we need, or which can be useful to us in the future we've never even explored. These are called um, sometimes future options for humanity. So all of these strange, crazy things that are hardly known, they could have all kinds of uses we've never dreamt of. Uh, and then the last reason why, why we need this and why we should keep it is, wow, isn't it amazing? We have art galleries. They're beautiful. They enrich our lives. Doesn't all this biodiversity enrich our life as well? And here's a final little sales pitch. If you've enjoyed exploring this tree of life with me on stage, you can also explore it outside in the Ratio exhibition, and you can explore it online. It's a, a completely free public resource run by a not-for-profit organization called OneZoom. So you can go, and everything you've seen here, you can explore. And in case you do want to support it, you can sponsor a leaf, just as I did this. I sponsored this leaf a couple of days ago to thank Ratio for inviting me to this talk, and that's why their name appears there on that leaf. And so I'd like to thank Ratio again, as well as many others. Thank you very much. <laughs>